And we are live. This is JWC live stream. JWC live stream. Our usual show, uh, Story Autopsy with Ricky and Tom, is without a Tom. So we're doing just an old classical live stream, and this will be a read. Um, today with us, we have the honored guest, uh, our, our uh, author, Amber Danson, everyone. Hi, everyone. Yes, uh, um, that's Amber. Uh, I'm Ricky, and uh, we're both creatives, at least creatives. I, I call myself a creative obsessor uh, because I'm, I'm constantly writing, constantly thinking about stories, and just recently started up with poems again after a long, dearthy uh, winter of no posy. Uh, all of a sudden, it's back. It's unbelievable. Um, wrote like a bunch over the last couple of days. And I, I handed them off to um, to our resident poet. We'll see what, what he has to say. Uh, the other thing I've been working on is, is Chiram 6. Wrote a couple hundred words of that today, um, which is a sci-fi novel. And a whole lot of fun uh, to write. I just got in there. I'm like, you know, 13,000 words and something like that with outline for, for miles. Um, but that's, that's my angle. Uh, Amber, how, how are you doing creatively? What have you been working on lately? I'm doing better than I had been. I had a sort of creative dry spell for a little bit, but now I'm back to working on my mythological creature short story collection I'm about halfway done with the one about the unicorn. Yeah, f fascinating, of course, like what you do with mythical creatures, cryptids, and just non-human intelligence in general. Um, it's really, really great. Um, I can't wait till you get that stuff in print because I know people are going to gobble it up. Um, so that must be very satisfying when you can throw down on, on a project like that. Cause uh, I, I love that genre of, um, I mean, I don't know what you call it. Cause I get it's fairy tales, but it's like, when you start talking about like Bigfoots and you know, all this other stuff, it, it turns more for me into like paranormal fiction. Like, even if it has elements, not saying it can't have elements of fantasy, and it's certainly not. It, it, it can. Yours do. But um, I don't know what you would call it, ultimately, because some of them are fairy tales, and some of them, like, yours blur the distinction, which is welcome. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not it's far from a problem. So how, how do you see it, like the stuff you write, uh, if you were to put a genre on it, you know? Uh <laughs> I don't know. A lot of them, I would think, are kind of like urban fantasy. A lot of them are more paranormal fantasy or paranormal fiction. So it's hard to really say. I haven't, I haven't given it a whole lot of thought, and I pity the librarian who has to. Yeah, well, it will be a little bit of a, of of a intricate thing to decide. I think because it's like the extended universe of it all. It feels like. Um, what I was trying to achieve with my Nidhogg Chronicles. Um, it feels like it all, it could all sit in a, in a nice, uh, you know, collectivity together. Like if your Bigfoot and my chomper met like somewhere in the wilderness, it wouldn't be totally ridiculous, you know, like it would make sense. Um, well, that's awesome. Uh, that you're working on that because that just means that those collections will be done sooner. Um, and, you know, speaking of that, of course, uh, do you have anything to read uh, tonight? Um, yeah, I have one about mermaids and one about Mothman. The, the, um, I think it's the sort of West Virginia area cryptid. Yeah, that's the original take on it. They saw it near a bridge collapse, and two teenagers saw it 
when they were driving, they were going for a joyride through a, um, a, a disused weapons depot and their car got buzzed. Like, I think it was just a little after sundown. It got buzzed by this monstrous thing and people correlated it to the, that, that famous bridge disaster. What is it? Point Pleasant or whatever. People say they saw it at many disasters that it's a harboring of, um, uh, disasters. People say they saw it in Ukraine and all over the place. So it's a creepy thing. I'll tell you. Um, I love Mothman stuff uh, and mermaids. Who doesn't dig mermaids? Who's into fantasy and mm-hmm. fiction, right? So which one do you think you're going to read? Well, I can, I have time to read them both if if uh they don't go too because neither one of them goes too long but uh, the mermaid one is first in just the order of the document hit it up then let's let's hear it Uh, it's gonna be a treat uh either way so all right this is waterborn my father used to joke that i was supposed to be born a mermaid I don't know. I know I don't have to explain my water lust to you, my son. Let me tell you about the dive which imprinted itself most deeply in my memory, the day I saw the impossible. Your father and I had recently purchased our first boat, and Yuri was eager to take it out on the water as much as possible. He whistled as he piloted the boat through the light congestion outside the port of Haifa in Israel. We went out well beyond the oil platforms, not wanting the beauty of the day to be spoiled by the blocky background of metal rigs. I remember a bright, cloudless day. The water was a deep, brilliant blue. We were far off land, over the Levantine Basin in the Mediterranean Sea. Beneath me was warm ocean waters sinking to a depth of more than 2,000 meters, far deeper than you could dive without a hard suit. It would be nothing but water and sea life all around me with no sight of the ocean floor. Yuri cut the engine and dropped anchor. He joined me at the stern as I checked over my gear. I will be down for a while, I said, looking up at him. He nodded toward his fishing pole and smiled. I know. You won't catch much at this time of day. I began to shove myself into my wetsuit. He shrugged and gave me the special smile I loved so much. His teeth were vivid white amid the darkness of his neatly trimmed beard. I enjoy the silence. I laughed. It was a long-standing joke between us that I spoke five sentences for every one word Yuri uttered. He unpacked his fishing gear and I finished heaving the wetsuit up my body. I perched on the low wall and slipped into my monofin, watching him through my lashes. Going down, I said, grabbing my mask. Yuri looked up from his tackle box. He smiled and gave me a kiss. Go with God. I brought the mask to my face, put the goggles over my eyes, and tumbled backward into the water. I had sand-filled weights at my belt, just heavy enough to counteract my buoyancy, since I had no need for a heavy tank. I began to sink gently into crystal clear water that faded to deep blue in all directions. It was so magnificent, I nearly forgot to breathe. The burn in my lungs reminded me that I had a pesky need for oxygen. I breathed deeply, pleased with the new technology. Yuri had gifted me with the mask last Hanukkah, and it must have been frightfully expensive since they were not on the market yet. I turned my body in a slow arc, careful not to tangle myself in the tether, and began to dive, both legs pumping the single fin at an easy pace I could keep up for quite some time. I continued my descent for several blissful minutes before movement caught my eye. It was as much ahead of me as it was beneath me. Something about the way it was moving prompted me to change the angle of my descent. Squinting, I peered into the greenish gloom. The indistinct shape appeared to be in some distress, thrashing about in a panic. It was oblong in form and about half my size. As I swam closer, it let out a high-pitched squeal similar to a dolphin call. I was still some distance away when I realized this thing was no dolphin. It had arms. I stopped. I had seen no other boats. A treasure hunter scouting for sunken ships, perhaps? They could be dangerous. But 
Those thrashing movements spoke of pain. It was my duty to God to offer my aid. I pulled out my diving knife with a grimace. I knew nothing about fighting, less so in the water. Several pumps of my legs brought me closer. When I got a clear look at the creature, I froze in astonishment. What I saw was impossible. Hands, the long fingers webbed to the second knuckle. A human-like face, the angular eyes larger than my own. Ribbons of dark hair. But this creature's fin wasn't man-made. Rubbery blue-green skin covered a fluke like a whale's tail. Dark swirls eddied past me. My numbed brain identified blood. It was the blood which forced me to understand what I was seeing. I did a quick spin, searching for the dreaded triangle fin, but aside from the strange thing before me, I was alone. No sharks. The creature let out that squeal again and fixed its large eyes on me. It was still trying to swim, but jerkily, with the same desperation I had seen many times when Yuri was fishing. I almost swam away. I loved to be in the water, but I was wary of sharks. I had no idea how long this thing had been sending out its long-distance crimson call. I took a long look at the impossible creature. The fear in its eyes decided me. I swam closer. I kept my knife in my hand, but kept that hand by my side. I had no wish to frighten it, but who knew if it would accept my help? Its gaze never left me as it continued trying to swim. A long slice in its tail, about where its thigh would be, continued to bleed. I studied that round face. Plump cheeks and a snub nose, maybe half my size. As I closed the distance, I realized with a dim sense of shock that I must be looking at a child. Its deep blue eyes were filled with terror and pain. I paused a few yards away. Since the mermaid child was still watching me so intently, I raised my knife and slid it back into the sheath strapped to my thigh, keeping my movement slow. If I had any hope of helping, the little one would need to understand first that I meant no harm. It paused and stared at me with eyes that were beginning to glaze. It should be breathing heavily, but I could see no gills. No wonder this thing was so panicked. It had lungs, not gills, and if it could not fight its way to the surface soon, it was going to drown. I swam quickly, ignoring the merchild's instant panic. It shrieked as I wrapped my arms around its middle, but I held it against my chest, and with a practiced twist, we were both oriented toward the surface. The creature stopped struggling when I began to swim. Its strange hands clamped onto my wrists with surprising strength given its injury, and, align and it aligned its tail with my legs, making us more streamlined. Pleased with its intelligence, I ditched my weights and put on a burst of speed, praying I would not make myself sick by surfacing so fast. <clears throat> we broke the surface moments later, and the merchild let out a human-like gasp. Its body went limp in my grasp, and for a frantic moment I thought it had died. And then it began to breathe in great shuddering gulps. I took my mask off, secured it, and began to breathe the sweet sea air. A moment later, I remembered the gash in my young charge's tail. I, lift, I shifted my grasp, gently persuading it to lie flat along the water, ignore, exposing the injury to the open air. It was ragged and nasty looking, longer than my hand by an inch or so. I could not see how deep it was because it was still oozing blood. I was wondering if this wild child would hold still for stitches when it dipped its face into the water and let out another of those peculiar squeals. I saw dorsal fins in the distance and my heart nearly stopped. I was just about to swim for my life when the slippery body in my arms let out a high-pitched whistle, a sound that was answered by unmistakable dolphin chatter. Dolphins. I felt my body sag with relief. Not sharks, but dolphins approaching us at a fast swim. Interspersed among the dolphins were the lithe figures of what had to be adult mermaids. Even if a shark did come, here was more than enough defense against it. Doubtless, this was my young charge's family. This impression was confirmed when the merchild tried to swim again. I relaxed my grip, not wanting anyone to think that I was an enemy. The merchild thrashed its tail once, let out a shrill cry along with a fresh burst of blood, and began to sink fast. I gulped air and dived after it. It grabbed onto me at once, winding its arms around my neck. Its thin body trembled. 
I wrapped my arms around its middle, gave it a reassuring pat on the back, and looked toward the oncoming crowd. I saw what looked like surprise on the nearest faces. I heard one call out, and my young charge turned its head over its shoulder to answer. Though the merchild's grip on me was strong, it also seemed to be weakening. I twisted slightly and swam us to the surface. I heard Yuri shout from the distant boat just before my head broke the water. Moments later, I was surrounded. I estimated 20 or so adults and at least as many dolphins. Many of the mer people held spears tipped with stingray barbs, though thankfully the weapons were not pointed at me. Some were even identifiable as female, and some, though these stayed at the fringes, had small children clinging to their backs. The dolphins stayed even farther out, jumping and splashing about in the warm seawater. I looked back at the boat, many hundreds of yards behind me. I heard Yuri shout a question and, and answered with, It's okay! There was a vigorous response to my cry, mostly from the sleek, dark heads all around me. They chattered among themselves with clicks and squeals, drowning out Yuri's reply. They were silenced by a sharp screech from one of those nearest to me. A male, I thought, and with disturbingly powerful shoulders. God helped me if he decided I was a threat. He met my gaze. His eyes were a very dark blue-green and big enough to make me think of anime. He clacked something at me and held out his arms. You should look at this, I said, as though he would understand, and turned the merchild so the injury could be plainly seen. There was some hubbub. The big one in front of me called out, and one of the ones at the rear swam forward. This one had silver streaks in his tightly braided hair and was adorned with a necklace of sand dollars. He wore a belt of what looked like fish skin, which had several pouches attached to it, woven of seagrass. The big one swam a pace or so backward, leaving room for the elder one. He swam right up to me and barely hesitated as he reached for the child. In his face, I saw a reflection of how odd I must look to them, how alien and unknown, and yet this elder was willing to trust that I meant no harm. I lowered my arms, hoping to show that I did not want to keep the child from them. The elder must have, un must have understood, but he was unable to detach those wiry arms from around my neck. He gave a whistling trill and pushed the child against me. I hesitantly wrapped my arms around the little body again, holding it at an angle to allow easy access to the injury. The healer began rooting through one of his many pouches. Within moments, he produced a curved bit of fish bone with some sort of filament attached. I barely had time to wrap my brain around the fact that these impossible aquatic people ha had medicine as advanced as stitches before the healer merman drove the needle into the merchild's flesh. Its tail spasmed and I tightened my grip. I knew enough about first aid to know that the young patient needed to be kept still. I was fascinated by the expert speed as the healer stitched the nasty gash closed. The thick webbing between his long fingers, which I had thought would make him less than dexterous, folded up neatly between the fingers. He might not be able to press his fingers together as closely as I could, but this in no way inhibited his ability to use tools. He bit off the last stitch and reached into a different pouch. The little one whimpered through this ordeal and let out a great shuddering sigh when it was finally over. I could sympathize. That bone needle was thick. I stroked the child's back in a soothing up and down motion. Its skin was both supple and rubbery, similar to dolphin skin. I could imagine the force necessary to push a needle through it. The big one clacked and the healer answered with a staccato sound. The child pried its face out of my shoulder and hummed something, sounding unbearably weary. The big guy swam to within an arm's length of us and held out his arms again. I gently transferred the unresisting body into the arms of what I assumed was its father. The merchild turned its head and gave me a very human-like, closed-lipped smile. I copied the smile, feeling a thrill deep inside my heart. The father inclined his head, then clacked at the healer without taking his eyes off me. The healer dipped his head in an identical gesture and reached up behind the big one's neck. Not until he had unfastened it did I realize that the big guy had also been wearing a necklace. It was a beautiful polished abalone shell strung on a cord of some kind. The healer faced me and issued a complicated series of clicks and whistles, holding the gleaming shell and its thong in both hands. 
I could hardly believe they wanted me to take it. For me, really? He gave me a close-lipped smile and proffered the amulet again. Thank you, it's simply lovely. I took the shell as it was being offered, reverently, with both hands. I inclined my head to the big guy, doing my best to mimic his gesture. There were smiles throughout the band, and a few children peeked at me. I noticed that none of them showed their teeth when they smiled, and I was glad I had not offered a broader grin. One of the juveniles, in size somewhat between the one I had helped and the adults, swam up to me and began gently touching me, a look of wonder on its face. I held out my hand and it, she, there were budding breasts, seemed to be as fascinated by my unwebbed fingers as I was by her webbed ones. We clasped hands and I allowed her to then take my hand in both of hers. She manipulated the digits, making clicks and other noises while I inspected her long braid. The hair felt exactly as human hair does when wet and was braided in a beautiful herringbone pattern. The idyllic moment was broken by Yuri's voice, calling to me from the boat. The engine was on and he was heading toward us. I'm all right, I called, turning my head over my shoulder. When I turned back toward the mermaids, they were already leaving, swiftly and silently, moving as sinuously as the waves they vanished beneath. By the time Yuri reached me, they were gone, the dolphins with them. What was all that? He asked from the side of the boat, reaching toward me to encourage me out of the water. I didn't move. I held the shell to my heart, remembering the intelligence in the eyes of the creatures I had helped. Clearly there was more in God's design than I had been taught. Shira, what happened? The urgency in his voice pulled me out of my reverie. I swam up to the side of the conquest and reached up for him with one hand. The mermaid amulet clutched my other hand. I gave a mighty crick, I gave a mighty kick as I grabbed his hand, propelling myself out of the water. He hauled me onto the deck and sank onto the wooden planking with me. It was mermaids. Lightheaded, I opened my hand to reveal the palm-sized shell. I had no idea what material the cord was made of, only that it had been woven from green fibers that had subtle differences in color, making the cord as pretty in its own way as the shell that hung from it. What? He stared at me in disbelief, then his gaze dropped to the iridesc iridescent abalone shell. Where did you get that? I told him everything. I felt lightheaded. The entire experience, including the gently pitching deck beneath me, was beginning to seem unreal. I never wanted to forget a moment of what had happened, so I gave him as much detail as I could, hoping it would help cement the experience in my memory. Yuri was silent for a long time when I finished speaking. He sat staring toward the now empty sea while I wearily clambered out of my diving gear. Finally, he said, there's a shark coming. The, base, the bass are practically leaping from the water to avoid it. How about grilled fish tonight? Sounds wonderful, I said, tying the mermaid amulet around my neck. Yuri grabbed the fishing rod and went to the bow. With his free hand, he grabbed the binoculars hanging from his neck and began scanning the water. I stayed where I was, rubbing my fingers over the slick contour of the well-polished shell. I was grateful Yuri had not challenged my tail. He was sure to have seen something odd, there the, though there was no way he had seen the mermaids as clearly as I had, even with the binoculars. We never spoke of the mermaids again, but from then on, I wore the abalone shell necklace every time I went out into the water. It became my diving talisman, and I could never look at it without a sense of awe. It is with great pride that I now pass the amulet on to you, my son. Your father never did believe me, but it, and it put some strain on us that he would scoff at me when I would be extra careful to pack that abalone shell before a diving trip. Never mind, that you are willing to believe me is enough. With this amulet, the mermaids will know you if they see you in the water, and perhaps they will come to you as they did to me. Perhaps you too will experience the wonder. And that's it. Wow. 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 That's all I can say. That's a real tasty one. Um, I mean, just everything about it. You know, you start off innocent enough diving um, with all of its perils. 
and you wield industry so wonderfully here because you you give us all that data that's realistic about diving like worried about the bends coming up too quick being careful about how to put the suit on and once we get down and we encounter that mer child uh which i'm assuming she was in a net or snared up or something but she was injured or he i i, I forget which but the industry that's at work, the subterranean cult, like this, the subsurface culture of the Merc uh, people, um, you know, the fact that when they came up, you could see all this tribal paraphernalia on them. And then your imagination gets working like, oh, well, these they all make that stuff. Uh, and they have a they have a tradition uh, that taught them how to do all that. And their their gear, you know, their regalia, you know, their the, the practical stuff they have, and they're traveling with dolphins the way that um, hunter gatherers would travel with with canines. You know, it's just like it's it's everything about it is like well balanced. And then we find out the the legacy connection because the uh, the amulet is passed down to the next family. And it's just like it's it's a great story within a story. Like all that stuff is great. Um, and even even when you're considering <clears throat> environmentals, between that and uh, how precise you are with all the industries and the world building, it's like there's no dump shocks. It's nothing but immersion. And I, I had news flashes. Like I'm like. What would happen if they didn't show up and she had to take this this child with her or something because it's too okay. sick? It's injured and it's like upset. So like what if she had like an in-ground swimming pool that she would have to like drain the chlorine and fill it with seawater? And it's like all the first it would be a bathtub, you know, and then it's like, how do you catch <laughs> how do you catch an injured mer creature and yeah. keep it safe and and uh on the way to being healthy again um so it's like between that and like the whole idea you you set it up you're like well this this son of hers could end up being you know have another destined call with mer creatures if if uh if he's a diver and he carries on the tradition he could end up uh i mean point is is it's great and if you wrote more of it <laughs> i don't see how that's a problem um great work on that where, where did the muse flash for that one hit like like what wh where where did that idea come from i watched a show on a th it was either to the discovery channel or animal planet i can't remember which called mermaids the new evidence and it was kind of on the one hand, you want to believe. On the other hand, it's like, I don't know. But it's like, I, I got to thinking, what if? And the creatures they described that these guys had swore they seen and had a body of one of them for a little while. Um, but I'm like, you know, that's what I imagined mer people would kind of be like. And hanging with dolphins just makes sense because dolphins are real intelligent and i mean if dolphins were used to mer people that it would explain why they're so cool with humans and it's also like the way the dolphins vocalize and the intelligence with which they're said that, uh to, to communicate it's like they're clicking and stuff they could use the dolphins as devices it would be like uh you know a, a surface tribe like well, I'm going to take the wolf with us. I'm going to take the hound. And if the hound starts howling, then you know to come join us. It's like the dolphin clicks a certain way. They could have like some kind of um, sonic internet down there where the dolphins are talking to other dolphins and then they relay. Because I, I wonder, ultimately, uh, do the mer people speak, uh, the mer folk, do they speak dolphin? Because if they speak dolphin and there's interspecies communication, then it's like you you could get some amazing stuff hap happening there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, th that's not something I had decided one way or another for this particular story. 
but I do have a version of Romeo and Juliet I was going to do at some point with mermaid and sea elves. And uh, I was going to have the mermaids uh, speak dolphin. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, please do, because that was just right. You, I mean, it's another another cryptid, another fairy story that you, you absolutely nailed. And a great read besides um so that is really cool uh wh what else um moving right along of course uh you know how it is when you're having fun yeah um what else do you have to read uh this evening before sunrise is my little mothman story it's not too long i don't think so i'll get this loaded up here sounds great Saul stared at the endless dark highway in front of him. Little Jean, tucked into her booster seat with her blankie, was already asleep. Beside her, seven-year-old Ray had stopped asking questions and was beginning to doze off himself, his head pillowed on his SpongeBob SquarePants stuffed toy. In the back, ten-year-old Mary played some sort of card game with her twelve-year-old brother Derek, something that required little more than an occasional murmur from one or the other. Though their reason for traveling was a sad one, it was nice to be with his family. After losing his mother, he felt now more than ever how important his wife and children were to him. How much farther to the airport, Derek asked absently, flipping a card onto the pile between himself and his sister. Three hours. Flight 13 takes off at quarter to seven, and Uncle Rick will pick us up at DFW airport. Then we go to the hotel and rest up for Grandma's funeral. I have to pee, Deborah said from the passenger seat. Seven months pregnant, she needed frequent rest stops. Saul sighed, impatient but not willing to sacrifice her comfort. I think the last sign said five miles to the next exit. I'll make it, she assured him. He nodded, forcing himself to relax. They were making good time, after all. A few minutes later, he took the Bondsville exit and pulled into a gas station. He consulted the map while Deborah ran into the store with Ray and Mary. Deborah was back in the Explorer within 10 minutes, shepherding the children with her customary efficiency. She smiled at him as she climbed into the seat. Impulsively, he leaned over and kissed her before turning in his seat to survey the kids. Mary was already buckled and reabsorbed in her card game. Ray finished wrestling with his own seatbelt as Saul watched and gave his father a gap-toothed grin. All was well. Satisfied, Saul cranked the engine and pulled out of the parking lot. Getting back on the highway means doubling back, but this rural route goes the way we need to go. Deborah gave him a sleepy smile. The only drawback of a rural highway at this time of night was the risk of deer, so Saul kept the high beams on. There were no other cars to be disturbed by the bright lights. He kept scanning the road and the dark verges on either side, ready to put the brakes on if a deer stepped in front of him. Without taking his eyes from the road, he reached over and placed one hand on Deborah's bulging belly. The unknown life inside gave a lazy turn, pushing against his touch. His lips curled and he returned his hand to the steering wheel. From the back, Mary's shrill voice rang out. What is that? Whoosh! A dark shape dropped into the road ahead. Saul braked hard. Was that a deer bounding into the road? But it was way too big to be a deer. Red eyes gleamed in the darkness. His heart tried to crawl into his stomach. Deer don't have wings, a small part of him whispered. Oh my God, Deborah sounded hysterical. Oh my God, Saul, what is that thing? Saul opened his mouth to answer, then gasped when something hit the roof hard enough to rock the vehicle. The suspension bowed, talons shrieked against metal, and Saul slammed on the brakes, his muscles quivering in response to the surge of adrenaline. Deborah and Mary screamed. Jean let out a wail. The explorer skidded as it slowed. The creature tumbled from the roof and was back on its feet in an instant. Massive, charcoal gray wings snapped open. Though man-shaped, it had a face straight out of horror movies, giant red eyes and inhuman features. The next moment it was gone. 
The noise in the car made it difficult to concentrate. Jean and Ray sobbed, Mary was screaming, and Deborah prayed while Derek shouted questions. Saul wanted to holler for silence, but he couldn't unclench his teeth any more than he could unlock his hands from the steering wheel. He let up on the brakes and steered the car out of its skid, his heart pounding in his ears. He pulled over, but didn't put it in park or cut the engine. Keeping his foot firmly on the brake, he half turned in his seat. Everyone okay? I'm scared, Mary said in a whimper. Me too, Derek said, white-faced. I want to go home. Ray sat clutching his SpongeBob toy as if it could protect him. Deborah wiped the, cheer the tears from her cheeks and unbuckled. Turning, she knelt in her seat, pressing her back hard against the dash to leave room for her belly. Don't squeeze the baby, Saul objected. Hush, Jeannie, it's okay. Mommy's here, Deborah crooned. The four-year-old wasn't gripped by the same terror as the rest of them. She hadn't seen the apparition, but her family's fear had driven her to hysteria. Dad, what the hell just happened? What was that thing? Derek gripped the seat back in front of him with both hands, his eyes huge. Saul had no answers. What good was he as a father if he couldn't explain what just happened to them? Jeannie, shh, shh. Deborah's efforts were producing no response from Jean. I want to go home, Mary whimpered. I might have to go back in there to get her. I might have to go back there to get her calmed down. Deborah reached for the door handle. Saul punched the automatic locks. Nobody is getting out of this car until we're sure that thing isn't out there waiting for us. Deborah pressed herself back into her seat and stared at him, her blue eyes huge. You're right, that thing came out of nowhere and it's too dark to see much. But really, don't you think it was a deer? I don't know. He rubbed his shaking hands over his short hair. We should go. We should really go now, Derek said. Buckle up, Saul said to Deborah, silently agreeing with his son. Saul pulled back onto the road. The reassuring purr of the explorer's engine helped soothe them all. Jean's hysterical howls eased back to hiccups and sniffles. He checked his mirrors. Darkness behind him, darkness in front of him. It must have been a bird, some sort of really big bird. Stahl checked the speedometer. Keep it at a steady climb. 30 miles an hour, 40. The red eyes appeared beside Saul's window. He let out a shout and swerved away pushed harder on the gas, up to 45, but the creature kept pace with the car. Deborah and the children screamed as the huge winged thing slammed into the side of the Explorer. A loud bang made the vehicle jump. Saul fought the steering wheel as the Explorer lurched back and forth. Gravel crunched under the tires, pinging bits against the metal frame much like gunshots. This could not be happening. Saul put on the brakes, fighting against the instinct to push it too hard. The red-eyed apparition swooped away, but before he could come to a complete stop, Deborah let out a terrified shout. The thing was now on her side of the explorer. With an ungodly shriek, it hurled itself against the fender. The explorer careened off the road. Saul wrestled with the steering, struggling to get it back onto the road. The explorer shifted, clipped a tree with the driver's side headlight. It jumped sideways and came to a shuddering stop. Both airbags exploded. For several moments, the only sound was the hiss of steam. Then a wail rose into the air, and another and another. Dazed, Derek shook his head to clear it. His little brother and both his sisters sobbed into the night. In the front seat, nothing but silence. Ow, I think I hit my head. Derek winced, touching a tender spot near his temple. Mary, Ray, you guys hurt? I want to go home. I want to go home. Mary's wailing made an almost rhythmic counterpoint to Jean's terrified howls. I'm okay, Ray said in a small, scared voice. Mary, stop crying for a second. Let me know you're okay. Derek wrestled with his seatbelt for a moment before he got it unlatched. Easing forward, he grabbed his sister by the shoulders. Did you hit your head? Don't worry, I'm sure we'll go home soon. Mary took several deep, shuddering breaths. I'm okay, too. Dad? Derek eased past Jean, relieved to see no blood or broken bones on his littlest sister. 
Saul moaned, a guttural sound like nothing Derek had heard. Dad, you okay? Derek put two fingers to his dad's throat. The firm throb he found reassured him. Deborah let out a soft sound. Her limp shoulders straightened and she raised her head. What? Where are we? Dad wrecked the car because some crazy thing came out of nowhere. Derek shook his father's shoulder, alarmed by the blood on his face. Saul jerked away with a confused cry, then gave his son a weak smile. Hey, buddy, everyone okay? I'm okay, Deborah said in a soft voice, but my seatbelt is jammed. I can't get it off. Saul reached past her and dug around in the glove box. Deborah reached behind herself as best she could and wrapped her fingers around one of little Jean's madly kicking feet. The touch worked its magic, and soon the howling was little more than hiccupy sniffling. Saul tracked down the seatbelt cutter he kept in the glove box and sliced through Deborah's seatbelt. He rested one hand in the, on the slope of her belly. Is the baby kicking okay? Kicking like mad, actually, she assured him with a shaky smile. Is the engine still on? Saul nodded, but cut it off because of the column of steam rising from the front of the Explorer. Looks like the radiator's busted, though. I'll call AAA. She dug her cell phone out of her purse. I don't think anybody should get out of the car till the tow truck gets here, Saul said, peering into the darkness. There was no sign of the red-eyed monster, but it had come screaming out of nowhere several times already. Or at least until the sun's up, Deborah added. She was also staring into the empty landscape, but her left hand reached towards Saul, silently seeking comfort. He curled his fingers around hers and adjusted the rearview mirror so he could see the kids. Mary and Derek were pale, but Mary had stopped crying in the face of her parents' calm acceptance of the situation. It probably helped that Derek had his arm around his sister's shoulders, and he seemed to be taking heart from comforting her. Saul listened while his wife was put in while his wife put in the request for a tow truck, followed by a call to the police. He couldn't stop scanning the trees in the surrounding countryside, looking for the creature that had run him off the road. He wished he had brought his gun. After a few moments, his hands tightened on the steering wheel until his knuckles were white. There, under a tree a few yards away, the demonic eyes were staring at him. In the weak light of the approaching dawn, he could see the furled wings. The tow truck is about said about an hour, Deborah said with a sigh, tucking her phone back into her pocket. The police will probably be here first. We'll manage, Saul said without taking his eyes off the creature. He hesitated, but finally decided not to call anyone's attention to the thing. The kids had only just calmed down, and it wasn't moving anyway. They played alphabet games as the sun rose higher. Distracted by the lingering presence and increasing visibility of the red-eyed monster, Saul kept losing the thread of the game until his fearful, impatient elder daughter demanded to know what he was staring at. Nothing, honey, he said, forcing his hands to unlock from the steering wheel so he could turn and give her a reassuring smile. I'm just a little rattled from the crash. When he turned to face the front again, the creature was gone. Flashing lights crested the hill a few minutes later. Tension drained out of Saul as the police cruiser came to a stop a few yards behind his explorer. Saul climbed out and went to meet the officer at the road. He knew he wouldn't be believed, but he wasn't sure what else to say but the truth. Officer Daniels was well chosen for his job. He maintained an impressive poker face through Saul's recital, scribbling notes in his memo pad as if oversized bird creatures were an ordinary occurrence. With his service pistol in one hand and flashlight in the other, he scanned the area for yards around before he returned to Saul. Holstering his pistol, Daniels said, whatever it was, it's gone now. We have some weird birds around here. Every now and then, locals report something like what you've seen. Seems odd, but it's got to be some kind of bird. Logical explanation, am I right? There are birds out there that big? Saul's eyebrows arched into his hairline. You'd be surprised. Harpy Eagle is about the size of a man. This has to be a nocturnal bird we don't know much about yet. What else could it be? You tell me. Daniel scoffed. Oh, sure, some folks talk about Mothman. Myself, I don't believe a word of it. Has to be a bird. Big old owl of some kind that nobody's ever captured. 
Saul folded his arms. Mothman? Big creature straight out of horror stories, or so I've heard. Glowing red eyes, ten-foot wingspan, sweeps in out of nowhere. Superstitious folk round these parts are scared of the thing, say it's a bad omen. Me, I say it ain't real. Folks imagine a lot of things when they're scared, and it can be scary when you don't know what you're seeing. I guarantee you, sometime soon, someone will find a big red-eyed owl, and that will end the rumors. Daniels clapped him on the shoulder. Saul grinned at him, relieved. I knew it was some sort of bird, but I just didn't realize there were birds out there that big. Yeah, big red-eyed bird. Daniels flipped his memo book shut and tucked it into his pocket with the pen. Shame it made you wreck. You folks okay, aside from being shaken up? We're okay. Saul looked over his shoulder at the Explorer, where he could see his family still looking white and wide-eyed. Seatbelts and airbags did their job. Daniels grinned. Good enough. Want me to take you somewhere? There are six of us, and someone has to wait with the car. Saul sighed and rubbed his hand over his hair. I can fit three kids in my back seat and one person in the front seat. I could call for backup. Saul shook his head. Nah, I'll just wait in the Explorer with my oldest son and have the tow truck driver drop us at a garage near my wife's friend's house. You can take Deb and the younger kids to Roxanne's. Daniels offered his hand. Sounds good. Do you want her to call? Do you want to call her to let her know you're on the way? Sure, just let me talk to Deb. Saul clasped the officer's hand and walked to the passenger side of the Explorer. Deborah rolled her window down. What's going on? Officer Daniels says there are some really big, weird birds out here. Every now and then the locals have reported a red-eyed bird. Saul shrugged and leaned against the car. Derek raised his eyebrows. Are you sure it was a bird? What else could it be? Deborah grasped the explanation as eagerly as Saul had. If the people who live in the area have seen a big red-eyed bird, then there has to be something out there we don't know much about yet. Something that only comes out at night so it's harder to study. We're perfectly safe, Saul added. Officer Daniels is going to take Mary, Ray, Jean, and Mom to Roxanne's house. You and me are going to wait for the tow truck and have the driver drop us off at a garage in walking distance of Roxanne's. It will be fine. I guess we're not making it to Grandma's funeral, Mary said in a mournful voice. Guess not, but at least nobody was hurt. Saul opened the panel door. Let's go, everyone. Grab your bags and keep them in your lap. Deb, you want to call Roxanne and let her know you're dropping by? Deborah retrieved her phone and made the call. Within 10 minutes, she and the younger children drove away in the officer's cruiser. Getting the Explorer towed went smoothly. AAA covered enough distance to put it in a garage close to Roxanne's home, and the garage was within walking distance of a car rental agency. It was just after 9 a.m. when Saul and Derek pulled the van into Roxanne's driveway. Derek bounded to the door ahead of his father and rang the bell. Nobody had responded by the time Saul joined his son on the stoop. Concerned, he knocked more loudly. Ray opened the door after a few moments, looking pale and worried. He flung himself at his father, babbling about a plane crash. Saul took the boy into his arms and hurried into the house, Derek on his heels. They found everyone together in Roxanne's living room, staring at the TV, wearing identical expressions of shock. Even Jean, tucked close to her mother's side, was somber. Roxanne sat between Deborah and Mary, clutching their hands. What's going on? Saul asked, anxiety making his voice sharp. It could have been us, Deborah whispered, not taking her eyes off the TV. Saul pivoted toward the TV when he caught the words Flight 13. Behind him, he heard Derek swear softly. He didn't bother reprimanding the boy since he was thinking the same thing. CNN was showing that Flight 13 experienced engine trouble, crashing into fiery devastation just beyond the runway. Mary, mother of God, Saul said, his arms tightening around Ray until the boy squirmed. The somber-faced reporter spoke of no survivors. 280 people gone in an instant. Deborah became hysterical, crying and babbling while she clutched her friend. When Roxanne's repeated requests that she calm herself for the baby's sake produced no results, Roxanne detached herself with some difficulty and went into the kitchen. 
Saul took her place beside Deborah. He settled Ray on his lap and put his arm around Deborah's shoulders, mouthing automatic words of comfort while his numbed brain tried to comprehend what was happening. Roxanne returned from the kitchen with a bottle of wine and, a, and an assortment of glasses. She shoved the glass of wine at Deborah, her so expression severe. This much stress is going to hurt the baby more than a glass of wine ever could. When Deborah continued to sob, Saul shook her, shook her gently and forced the glass into her hand. Drink it or I'll turn the news off. She began to sip the wine, mumbling and crying. Saul took the glass of wine Roxanne offered him, took a healthy swallow, and held the glass out to his shaking son. Derek took a gulp, grimaced, and passed the glass back. Mary let out a great shuddering sigh and said, what are we going to do? You're going to stay here tonight, Roxanne said in a tone that none of them dared to defy. Deb, come with me into the kitchen. You've seen enough of this. Come on, for the baby's sake. Roxanne coaxed Deborah off the couch and out of the room, aided by the fact that Deborah was not actively resisting. Take your sister into the kitchen with mommy. Saul gently put Ray off his lap and set Jean on her feet beside her brother. Ray took Jean's hand. Giving his father a brave smile, he towed his silently crying sister away, his SpongeBob toy tucked securely under his arm. Saul settled onto the couch with Derek on one side and Mary on the other. His children latched onto his arms as the footage of the crash played for a third time, and he was glad Roxanne was keeping Deborah occupied in the kitchen. Because Deborah was right. If that red-eyed creature hadn't run them off the road, they would all be dead. It could have been them. Maybe the winged apparition hadn't been terrorizing them. Maybe it had been trying to save them. Saul hung on to that one thought. Whatever that thing had been, it had saved their lives. Its intentions didn't matter in the face of that one basic truth. Yeah, really nice, well-balanced story. Um, and <clears throat> may I also say faithful to the Mothman tradition in its own way. Um, them having to contend with it, uh, flapping around the car, um, and it's, it's seeming harassment of them. And then he literally, it's like, it drives him off the road, you know, and, and he crashes it, but that little crash is far better than the crash that might've awaited them had the harbinger not, uh, intervened. There's something magical about, um, the entity, the spirit, the, the cryptid, whatever you want to call it encountered and interfering with the progress of somebody's plans and take, taking a, um, you know, the wheel of fate, as it were, and uh, giving it a twist. And in this instance, you know, it's, it's chess game kept them from all blowing up on that flight. And it's like, could you say that's a coincidence? It doesn't seem to be. But it, there's sufficient mystery you've woven, um, as well as lots of poetic immersives like the when they were in high pursuit over the gravel the pinging of the gravel underneath uh the car um that was a nice detail immersive pulled me right into similar vehicle speeds on similar highways um really just great stuff overall uh and a good read too glad you enjoyed it it was a lot of fun to write yeah, it's, it certainly seems that way. Um, makes me wonder about what I would do with a mo for a Mothman in um, Nidhogg Chronicles if I ever if I ever did a sequel. Um, what wh what fascinated you about the Mothman um, that brought this muse flash to you? Like, when did it occur to you to write a story about it? Well, when I watched, I think it was, I think it's called the Mothman Chronicles. That's when mm -hmm. I became aware of the existence of the cryptid and when I started having the idea to do short stories about cryptid creatures, which uh, that one started with the Bigfoot story. Um, I just started making a list of other cryptid creatures I could do stories about and Mothman was on the list and I'm like, well, what if he saves a fan from a plane crash? Yeah, yeah. Most of the time people associate these things with malevolence but every once in a while there's a story where even even something that's like you know 
um, most people would would find horrific. Every once in a while, the entity in question will give aid as opposed to uh, terrorizing, <laughs> you know, which would seem to be its its natural uh, gift. But it, it sidesteps that. There's those stories are fantastic. The ones that you're like, you, it makes you wonder uh, um, if they didn't look like that, what place would they have? You know. Um, Great though, great, great story. Um, and thank you for reading. So like always, when it comes to JWC live stream, you know, time flies when you're having fun and it's, we're, we're near the end of our, our program. So best to step up with plugs. Um, gotta keep the lights on, you know? Um, <clears throat> in this particular case, I want to plug JWC first and foremost, Joe's Writers Club. Go to joeswritersclub.com and joeswriters.club and sign up to our forums. Um, we have a writer's community that does fantastic stuff, and we're trying to bring you more and more uh, as time goes on. There's going to be new things emerging, uh, new reasons to join. Check out our uh, Zoom meeting on Tuesdays, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have our classic meeting where we get together and we read. It's it's not unlike what you just saw on the show. Uh, you know, whatever you're working on, if you're creative, bring it to the meeting and, and you know, you'll, you'll read. And uh, it's a fantastic thing to have that type of analysis, uh, but in the sense of a community, like no one's, no one's interested in anything like but inspiration like no one's going to be a harsh critic we're we're here to improve the process and to enjoy uh fiction so um this is a very nurturing writing community and uh just check it out joeswriters.club um watch this on our youtube like and subscribe to our youtube as well uh and uh, there's workshops. Check out our workshops. Go to go to joeswriters.club. Um, Amber, thank. I want to thank you again for reading. It was uh, really really fantastic, entertaining, and to hear what you do um, on the page is like it's a treat for me. Um, but I, please do plug. Uh, well, what are you what are you selling today as far as books are concerned? I'm still plugging away at my Death's Nightmare series. I've got uh, Death's Nightmare available for anyone to buy whenever they want. Amazon still has it on sale for 99 cents for the ebook. And I got uh, the sequel, Death's Gamble, available for pre order. That one gets released October 1st. Fantastic. Amber Danson, go over to Amazon. Uh, go pick up her stuff you heard what she was reading um her thrillers are amazing too i mean she's got it um and i'm i'm selling uh babeltron after the fire uh you know people call me ricky uh, richard andrew olkus is the author name go to amazon and check it out babeltron after the fire it's a dystopian cyberpunk book a uh, little, you know, it, it's a novella, but it, it packs a wallop. <laughs> uh, let me know what you think of it. If you've read it, uh, drop some comments and uh, don't be afraid to participate. And uh, we thank you again for uh, watching and uh, we hope to see you next time. You guys take care. Uh, <laughs>